If you haven't caught it in the music this morning, we're talking about our love, Christ's love for us, but our love for him in that. And if you look at the title of the message, Peter, do you love me? <laughs> we're talking about love. So this morning we return to the 21st chapter of John, and this morning we're going to finish our study in this incredible gospel. Um, it's a little bit sad for me. Uh, we've been invested a lot of hours in study and preparation um, in this series, and uh, I've learned a lot um, in doing uh, doing this series and going through in this time, and I trust that your knowledge and depth of understanding uh, of the gospel um, has grown over this over this nearly two-year study that we've been in the Gospel of John. And, and I pray that uh, just as it has done for me, uh, that you've grown in your faith and, uh, and your spiritual wisdom uh, in this time. This last chapter focuses on a large part, in large part on the Apostle Peter. Uh, in the first half of the chapter, we saw Peter had acted disobediently. Uh, and uh, because he was kind of the leader that, that when he disobeyed, he led six others right behind him uh, in disobedience. They were supposed to be up in the mountain, right? Remember along the, um, near uh, the Sea of Galilee up in the mountain waiting for Jesus to come and meet them there. Got tired of waiting. And uh, um, he kind of abandoned his call to ministry, but there were some reasons for that. You know, he denied Christ and... and uh, Holy Spirit hadn't come yet. They didn't feel like they were worthy. Maybe didn't have the the confidence or the the uh, empowerment to do the ministry that they had been called to to do. They maybe uh, felt inadequate in that. So in the first half of the chapter, Jesus appeared to the to the apostles for the third time that we know, third recorded time since his resurrection. Uh, met with them, fed them breakfast on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. In that and. Um, you know, if the gospel ended there, we wouldn't really know whether Peter had a, an official recommissioning uh, into the gospel um, ministry at that point. So we're thankful for these last few verses, verses 15 to 25 of this chapter, because uh, we see the restoration of Peter and uh, his reassignment into ministry uh, that God gives him uh, along the way. Uh, back in... in in the beginning of this, the ministry of Christ, back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, we see where he met these, these apostles along the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And, and he told them to drop your nets, come and follow me. And, and instead of fishing for fish, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And come and follow me. And, and uh, so three years plus, a little over three years from that again, <laughs> here. Here we're in the back in the same place along the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And Peter has led uh, his fishermen friends back to, um, back to, to fishing. And uh, that's not the Lord's plan for them. You, you are no longer fishers for fish. That's not what I've called you to do. That's not what you're supposed to do. And Peter needs to be restored. And, and as Peter's restored, the others again will follow. So God has a very significant plan uh, for Peter. Peter, this, this denying, impatient, impulsive guy, uh, God has a plan for him. Uh, in his life. So in this final scene of the gospel, we see one is essentially a, a call to faithfulness, not only for Peter, but for any believer, uh, for anyone who's going to serve the Lord. This is, this is uh, what a committed Christian looks like um, that we see here. So beginning in uh, verse 15 of John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. 
When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked the Lord, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? You must follow me. Because of this, rumor spread among the brothers, the disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, if I want him to remain until I return, what is it to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. We can all identify with Peter a little bit. He's like us. <laughs> he has his failures and we have our failures. He overestimates himself and underestimates temptation. <laughs> he thinks he's more committed than he is. And he thinks he loves the Lord more than he really does. He thinks he can face any trial triumphantly. He finds out he can't. <laughs> Uh, by the time we get to this point, even, even though we've seen the risen Christ, he, he, he is still really a, a broken man at this point. The disciples haven't received the Holy Spirit. Uh, they've, they've not been infused with that power. But they are familiar at this point with their own weaknesses. Uh, it's only been, you know, a, a short period of time since they ran and hid <laughs> as Jesus was arrested and, and uh, beaten and, and uh, crucified. All, all these things that have happened, it's easy for them to just kind of drift back to the life that they were comfortable with and that they were familiar with along the way. Um, they, they returned to fishing. Uh, but the Lord is going to call Peter back into a significant ministry and with him, then the rest of the group also. They're gonna, they will subsequently be empowered then by the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and these guys, these ragtag bunch of guys with all of their failures and weaknesses, in the power of the Holy Spirit will turn the world upside down. <laughs> what an amazing, amazing thing. But it requires a certain commitment for them to be useful. So here we, we, we see a call to follow Christ. And we'll see in this three components. Has a call to love Christ. Has a call to sacrifice for Christ. And a call to follow Him no matter what. For every believer, for, for every follower of Christ, there is a necessity of a call to love. A call to sacrifice and a call to obedience. And that's what we see here. This, this is the stuff that discipleship is made of. It's a clear statement. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Three things are, are easy to say. Love, sacrifice, obedience. Okay. But they're hard to do. <laughs> they are hard to do. Following Christ isn't easy. Uh, to love the way that they are expected to love. To sacrifice that way to obey is not easy. And so Jesus himself has already explained that, that, that sinners are to submit completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, to find, find their lives by losing them, to fulfill their lives by emptying them, right? To live their lives by dying to self. And you're like, oh, well, the, it, it, it's just hard to grasp hold of. Salvation isn't easy. Um, in practice, Jesus said it might require you to, to hate your father and your mother or your sister or your brother or your own life. It might require you to turn from everything you possess, all your desires, all your ambitions. If you want to follow me, Jesus said, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, which could even mean death, take up your cross and follow me. 
You need to count the cost. And the cost, the cost may be high. It might include death. This is an extreme call to a life-changing thing here. So why would people do this? <laughs> All of these harsh, difficult things, why would they do this? The only power that can motivate this kind of devotion is love. <laughs> even, even on a human level, um, we, can, we can understand that a little bit. Um, people who love greatly sacrifice greatly. People who love uh, greatly give up things for others. Love is powerful and a powerful emotion and a, and a powerful motivation. Uh, even even earthly love is so powerful it can draw the best out of people. People can uh, lay down their lives for the ones they love, right? You know, people that give up their life for their kids or their family member along the way that, that would do that. Sometimes it goes beyond that to maybe personal causes. And we know people that are willing to lay down their life for their country, for a cause, right? And that, that, that those things can happen. John 15, 13, Jesus said, Greater love has no, no one than this, that they lay down their life for a friend. People die for love. <laughs> love is a powerful motivation. And as far as Christians are concerned, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 14, it is the love that we have for the Lord that it says that controls us, or other translations say love that, that motivates us or drives us, compels us to serve him. We follow who we love. We follow things that we love in life, whatever they are. Uh, sometimes we chase after experiences because of a love in that. Love is a powerful motivator, <laughs> more powerful than any other. Uh, in this world. And so when we move it from the earthly kind of love that we understand a little bit to a spiritual situation, uh, a spiritual dimension, and a divine world, love is what causes us to serve the Lord with extreme acts of dedication. And so that's what we see. It's stated in the Old Testament and repeated, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We sang that just a little bit ago. And then love your neighbor as yourself. The Ten Commandments, Jesus says, are all summed up in those things, right? The first half are love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second half of the Ten Commandments is basically love your neighbor as yourself. It's, it's all rolled up into that, into loving others. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Whoever has my commandments and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and he will come to him, and make, and we will make our home with him. Over and over again, Jesus uses that all through what we've studied over the last many months. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father. He told him that we would care about others. So we see all of this picture of love all throughout um, all throughout this process and now we come to Peter <laughs> and what has gone on along the way we see this exchange between Jesus and Peter that that we just read and and in these first few verses of it we see this this total restoration of Peter you know, in today's world, if somebody would have done the things that Peter's gone through in denying Christ, we'd probably say, you know, well, this guy needs an intervention. <laughs> he's he's going to need six months of therapy, and and he's going to to really get back on track. Probably uh, there'll be a process here. He's got to uh, go through some work through some things in his past, and you know, unforgiveness. All right, he's it's going to take him a while, but maybe we can get him back to where he was. Not necessary here. <laughs> Jesus asked him one question three times. That's all it takes. <laughs> Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Because we follow what we love, right? We serve what we love. We sacrifice for what we love. 
or who we love. And so that's the question that he brings. For us to understand dedication the way that Jesus explains it in this illustration with Peter, we start by understanding that a committed Christian lives a life compelled by a love for Jesus Christ. Very practical. We come down to this uh, off the mountaintop of this this resurrection and all of this kind of incredible stuff that has happened and we get down to these stumbling, bumbling guys that are disobeying the Lord. And Jesus restores them. We need to realize in the end, that's how God chooses to do it. He chooses us. The stumbling, bumbling people that make mistakes and fail along the way because that's how God's chosen to share his message around the world. And so Jesus comes back to them and says, guys, this was a suggestion. This is your calling. This is your life here. Uh, like I said, Peter overestimates himself like we do a lot sometimes. Remember in the upper room the night before Jesus was crucified and, and uh, Jesus says, I'm going away, and where I'm going, you can't go right now. And Peter, impulsive Peter, jumps up and says, Oh, Lord, where are you going? Jesus says, Where I'm going, you cannot, you cannot follow. He says, Lord, I can follow you right now. I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And in a matter of a few hours after that, he denies him three times. Peter, I'll follow you anywhere. I could die for you right now. Really? We'll see. You're not ready for that. You think you are. Sometimes we do that in life. I can handle this. I got it. <laughs> not here. And so this is a public restoration of Peter. I mean, the other guys are there too. There. They see, they're there. They, they've just had breakfast. They hear what's going on in this. And in verse 15, Jesus calls Peter Simon. By the way, John uses Simon Peter when he refers to, in his gospel, when he refers to Peter through this. But you know, Jesus had met him and said, you're no longer going to be Simon. You're going to be Peter. Now, I'm going to change that. But in this case, what's he calling? Jesus says Simon. Simon, son of John. For Jonah, some of you might say his dad. It's a translation of his dad's name. Now that must have got his attention. Simon, son of John. It's like when your mom calls you with your whole name. <laughs> in Scripture, we'll see, and you can see in the other Gospels, when Jesus uses the term Simon when he refers to Peter, he's... He said, buddy, you are still in your old nature. <laughs> You're still acting like the world here. I've called you to be Peter <laughs> and, and be this apostle, this bold, strong apostle to declare the gospel, but you're still acting like Simon right now. Simon, son of John. <laughs> Peter had fallen so far that the Lord uses his old name, kind of He's acting like his old self, and so he, he gets his attention. Simon, son of John, do you love me? That's the question. Uh, that's a great question to ask any believer that is wondering and struggling and falling away for some things and stumbling in some areas of their life. Do you love the Lord? Do you love him? That's, that's a great place to start. But he doesn't just say, do you love me? And that first request, he says, do you love me more than these? He's not talking about the guys. The other guys that are with him. What's he talking about? Do you love me more than these things? I told you to put away your nets. I told you not to be, you're not a fisherman anymore. You are to be a fisher of men. Do you love me more than these, these things? These things of this world. Do you love me more? Are you willing to set aside those things for me? 
That's, that's what he calls us to do. Are you willing to sacrifice some things? Well, I got big plans. I'm going to do this and this. And... Okay. But do you love the Lord more than those plans so that if he leads you in a different direction than your plans, which are you choosing to follow? Do you love me more than these things? Doesn't mean you, you can't ever fish again. But I got to be your priority. That's what Jesus is telling you. I'm your priority. I'm calling you to do something that you can't even imagine at this point. Being a fisher of men. Do you love me more than these things? More than your former life? More than all your priorities and plans? Are you willing to give that up for me? That's what Jesus is asking him. Do you love me enough to walk away from this? And Peter replies, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But, she, but, but he changed the word. Jesus uses that word agape. Do you love me this much? This unconditional love? When Peter responds, and that's why if we could read Greek, it'd be easier. But, and Peter responds and he says, you know I love you, but he doesn't use agape, he uses phileo. That's like family, like family brotherly love, right? Philadelphia, phileo, phileo, that, that you know I have great affection for you, Lord. Do you love me unconditionally? You know I have great affection for you. Wait a minute, that's not quite, Peter, Peter can't quite get over the hump of where he's been with, with what he's done and denying Christ and doing some, being disobedient and doing some things. That's what we see here. Um, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter brings omniscience into this. Is that good or bad? Think about that. It ought to be good. Omniscience, he knows everything we think. Well, some of that we're not proud of probably, right? He knows everything that we're thinking about. But you know what? This is what you grab hold. Satan will mess with you with that part of it. Set that aside because here's the good part of, about the omniscience. Lord, you know that I love you. You know what's in my heart and my mind, Lord. And so you know that I do love you. <laughs> so don't, don't think about, oh, don't let Satan play that guilt card about, oh, he knows, he knows the thoughts or whatever I'm having. He also knows your heart. And if you truly love him, he knows that. So that's, that's good. And Jesus says, feed my lambs. If you love me, then feed my lambs. Don't miss the pronoun. Feed what lambs? My lambs. Feed my lambs, Jesus tells him. He's calling Peter. He's reminding him. Uh, Peter even, even learn, as he learns later when he writes his epistle, 1 Peter 5, he says, we are under shepherds and Christ is the chief shepherd. We're taking care of those around us that know Christ. He's, he's the chief shepherd. <laughs> and we're in charge of taking care of those around us in the body of Christ. All of us in our Christian ministry, whatever we're called to do, whether however we are being Jesus' hands and feet, taking care of people around us and reaching out to them and encouraging them and praying for them and all those things we're called to do. And Jesus again said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Same word, Jesus used a cop And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then take care of my sheep then, not just the frail, weak little lambs that he said in the first one, but all of them. No more fishing, shepherd my sheep. This is your calling. The third time Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This is painful for Peter. Jesus is asking three times now. But Jesus changes the word this time. Peter's were, do you really phileo me? Do you love me? She says, I'll step back down to where you're at. Well, I'll meet you there. 
Do you love me, Peter? Do you have that strong enough affection for me to set aside the things of this world? Jesus probes, probes deeper in, in this. Back in, in uh, chapter 10, we saw where Jesus talked about how he loved the sheep and how he gave his life for the sheep and how the sheep, sheep knew him and heard his voice. And now he's handing them over to Peter. Take care of my, my lambs. Feed my sheep. Paul reminds us we are truly weak clay pots. We're weak vessels. We're gonna, we, we crack easy. <laughs> we, we make mistakes. But we are empowered by a Holy Spirit to do the ministry that God, God calls us to do as his servants to reach out and care for others and show the love of Jesus wherever that leads us. If we are willing to love him that much, to set aside our priorities for his priorities. This is where all Christians, Christian commitment starts. Do you love Christ more than fill in the blank? Do you love me more than these things, more than this? And then we're, besides that, then we're called compelled by love for Christ. And then second, we're characterized by sacrifice for Christ. If any man will come after me, he will deny himself and take up his cross, Jesus said. That's exactly what Peter hears in, in uh, the next verse. I tell you the truth, right? That's how it starts out. Or truly, truly, depending on your translation. We talked about this phrase several times. Jesus says, watch out. Here comes. Here comes an important thing. New in, pay attention. This is new information. This is a new understanding. He says that 25 times in the Gospel of John, and this is the last time. This is number 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, and he tells Peter what's going to happen to him in verse 18. I tell you the truth, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted, but when you were old... But when you're old, you'll stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you to where you won't, don't want to go. Verse 19 tells us Jesus was telling Peter how he was going to die. He stretched out his hands. You know the story. If we read the rest of the things about Peter, what happened? Peter was crucified. Jesus says, when you get old, somebody, they're going to, you're going to stretch out your hands and they're going to take you to where you don't want to go. You will be a martyr for me, Peter. You will die. For me. And when it gets to the point where they're going to crucify Peter, remember what he does? Peter says, I'm not worthy to be killed the way my Lord was. And he requests that they crucify him upside down. So welcome back to the ministry, Peter. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, and by the way, you're going to die. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yep. That's what he's called for. Would that be scary to know that? Maybe. So Peter has been invited back to ministry. He's been reconnected and said, you know what? Feed my sheep and, and you're going to die. Would you want to know that? Would you want to know that? Hey, listen, I'm, I'm calling you to ministry to do this thing. And you're going to die because of it. You're going to die as a martyr. Is that good or bad? Would you want to know that? For Peter, that was important. Peter had denied Christ. Peter who said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. I'd die for you right now. I'd do any of this stuff. And then he denies him three times. This tells Peter, 
You're going to, Peter, you're going to have success with this. You're not going to deny me. You're not going to walk away again. Reassurance of what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't know whether it'd be good for you to know that or not. You have to figure that out. <laughs> but that's what he tells Peter. And then, and then the, he says, follow me again. At the end of verse 19, follow me. And, I, and somehow Jesus must have taken a few steps, walked, because it says Peter, Peter started, and then he took like two steps, and he turned. Well, so much for following him, right? <laughs> but he takes a couple steps, and he turns, and he sees John following them. John's been Peter's friend. He's been his business partner. He's been all, all this to him, and he sees him following him. And he says, Peter says, well, what about him? <laughs> he saw that. And he says, Lord, what about him? And Jesus said, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. We like that sometimes. But what about them? What's going to happen? How about that? What? He says, that's really none of your business. <laughs> that's not what you're supposed to be thinking about or worried about. Your job is to follow me. Follow me. <laughs> Good reminder. And then Peter clarifies so that people wouldn't be confused because that started a rumor. You know how rumors get started, right? <laughs> Did she, hey, I heard John was going to live until Jesus returned. Really? Is that what he said? John says, that's not what he said. He said if I wanted him to, it wouldn't be, it was none of your business. <laughs> he had to correct that here because the rumors apparently had gotten started. He had to correct it because if John died, then people would say, well, see, Jesus was wrong, right? He said, no, he says, no, that's not what Jesus said. It's not what he said. He says, but I am the one that testifies to this truth. You know me. John says, you've, you've seen what I've done. I wrote these things down, and you know that my testimony is true. To the people that he's writing. How can we only have part of what Jesus did? How can we only have part of his ministry and part of the stuff that he did? Oh, well, there's this last... That's the last question that's answered in this chapter. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. That maybe seems like hyperbole to you, but, but we live in a, a fascinating technological world now. It said that, that you're... The average individual's life alone, with all, every word you say, everything that you've done in your life. If, think about that. <laughs> if all of that was recorded, every single thing that you said and did in the entirety of your life, they said it would fill about 320 of the average libraries for one person. And nothing you'd read about me would be very profound, right? <laughs> it would be a lot of boring books in there too, right? Think about all of the data bits and all the stuff that's stored in computers and files and all that. Of course, they didn't have that then. It would have, it would have all been in longhand. It would have taken who knows what to take that. It's estimated the average person has less than 20,000 words in their vocabulary that we ever use. And yet we could fill 320 libraries with what we say and do. <laughs> in just one life. Well, you know what? Everything that Jesus has said and done is recorded in the cloud. Not in Google's cloud, in God's cloud. <laughs> and someday we'll, 
maybe we'll get to see and hear all of that, and we'll know all of that. We'll have all of eternity to understand it. And we'll get that opportunity. But what we are given, we are given for a purpose here. Right? We know that purpose statement. John says, I write these things so that you would know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that you would believe in them. And by believing in him, you would have life in his name. He's got his purpose and he's right, written it. We are called to love the Lord. We are called to love others in the name of the Lord. And we are called to faithful, faithful obedience to our master. Father God.